It's my pleasure and honor to ask the, the Nobel Laureate of Peace in 2018, Dr. Denis Mukwege, to take the stage. Karibu sana, Dakari. Thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege and honor for me to be here this afternoon, and I want really to thank the representative of the university to invite me, especially the vice chancellor and the dean of the faculty of medicine. Thank you all for being here. Saturday afternoon, I know that you should be elsewhere doing other things. But I'm so happy that you can be here because Congo needs you. I received the Nobel Peace Prize, but Congo still struggling with war and rap as a weapon of war. So I would like really to talk about this question that I think that all of you can do something to make the difference and make things change, not only in Congo, but everywhere in the world where there is conflict and where rape is used as a weapon of war. So we'll try to go very quickly with this question. Uh, rape exists in all society and sexual violence exists everywhere. But the diversity and complicity of sexual violence in peacetime depend much on social culture context. So many times people are thinking that sexual violence is something far away of them. But uh, in all our societies, we can see that sexual violence exists, but we have laws, we have customs, we have barriers who can just make them that in the peace time, we can see what we are going through in the war time. When the time when the war breaks down, the sexual violence increases significantly during this time. And there is some factors who are contributing, especially the poverty, but many times families are broken and there is separation. We have also the presence of armed groups, the impunity, and the disintegration of leadership structures. When there is war, the structure, the leadership structures are very weak, so people don't care, or sometimes they just know that they can do things without any consequences. And at this time, all form of sexual violence is increasing. There is also another sense in many contexts taboo are broken, and their sexual violence can be used even as a weapon of war. We have different forms of sexual violence. It's not only rape, but we can see the list with uh, the Rome statue of ICC. There is different kind of sexual violence. And there you have the list. And all this kind of sexual violence, slavery, prostitution, pregnant to force 
pregnancy, forced abortion, or for sterilization, or forced marriage, or men who are raping other men, or men raping uh, women. All this kind of violence sexual can be used also in different way by different armed groups and we can find different characteristics of this rape. It can happen in private or in public. Sometimes members of the family are forced to rape or to watch the rape of their family. And there maybe we don't show this, but it was in 2017 in Congo, in Kasai. This happened and they not only rape women in front of all the community by their own children, but also they put it on the social media. And this way to do is really a way to try to get as much as possible impact, not only on the victim, but also on the community. This can be systematic and massive when rape happened, that all the women in the village can be raped in one night, it means that it was planned to do it. You can't rape 300 women in one night if there is no plan to do it. The strategy can target sometime girls, women in the reproductive age, but also old women, and in my hospital we treat a lot of children under, even children under five years. This can be done with extreme violence in inserting objects, gang rape, burns, genital, and so on. When it comes to the scope and prevalence of sexual violence, Many times people are saying, oh, this was used. Yes, of course, it was used in many conflicts before. But I this is not uh, giving rape to don't be a crime. It's happened in the Second World War, in Bangladesh, and uh, in Balkan Wars. But we have very few conflicts without sexual violence. For example, we can just say that in Israel and Palestine, we didn't document really the use of rape as in this, con in, in this conflict. But also in Sri Lanka and El Salvador, we didn't document. But it can be also because of the lack of data, no reliable information or number of victims, and uh, I can say that also sometimes we have a problem. To talk about rape is not easier for victims. So when we, we, we said that in some conflict there is no rape, it can be also only because we don't have information or people don't want to talk about it. This is... Uh, Good. So there, on this map, where you have red color, it's a place where really rape was used as a weapon of, of war. But where we, when we have the green, we don't have reports or it's reports that rape was not used. Why sexual violence is used in conflict? Most of the time, this weapon is used to win war by controlling territory. And this is using to displace the population or to subjecting the, the civilians. And I can tell you that when rape is used as a weapon of war, especially it's happened in a place where women 
have impressions that they are not protected, the reaction is to leave the place and look another place where they can feel safe. I was in Iraq to talk with the Yezidi women in the camp, and we tried to discuss with them how they can go back in Sinjar. It's uh, their place they were before the war. And most of them told us we can't go back at this place to be raped again. We need protection. And if you are not protected, we can't go back there. And the reaction in the camp is to just to say, forget Singer. And this can show that you can get the same consequence as in a classic war. So the population are just leaving their village because they don't have security and they know that they can be raped again. And for this reason, they just decide to don't go back. But it can be used also as ideology in ethnic cleanism. And you have seen, for example, in Bosnia, to force women to be pregnant, even in Congo, to bring girls in the bush when they became pregnant after uh, 32 uh, weeks of pregnant, they, they just send them back in the community. And there, you have just to deal with this pregnant and get children who are called sometime in my country. They have many names, but you can see that with all these names, is just to create more problems in the community because there are children without any affiliation and women are, are even are still receiving some messages from perpetrators to say, we know that you have our child in your family. So it's a way, really, to just make a kind of terrorism and the ideology most of the time is the ethnic cleanism. But also to force a sterilization and this can be done in a different way. We saw it in Rwanda and after it happened in Congo, for example, to just destroy the genital of women so you are sure that they will not get other children of their own ethnic group. It can be also based on religion. And this happened with Yezidi. They have their own religion. And uh, I even, when I was discussing with Murad, one of his cousins was with I ISIS. And she said, after to go through the brainwash, this young boy, he become Muslims, and now he's against his own community. There is also a way to attract fighters. And we can see it with, in my country, for example, is to say, we are going to give you gun, and with this gun you can get money, you can get women, you can get everything. It's a way just to attract fighters, and especially they are attracting young boys. It can be also economic objective, and this is what is happening in Congo especially. Rep is used to gain access to mine, and uh, we can just see, we make this study, and this study show us that the victims that we're treating at Panzi Hospital, most of them were coming from the place where we have mine. So where we have mine, we have army groups, and it was the place where victims were coming from. The consequence can be on individual, on the family level, community level, but also on the society level. The consequence at the individual and family level is especially health consequences, and here we can talk about AIDS, sexual transmitted disease. We can talk about all the girls that we have, for example, at the hospital with their genital completely destroyed and uh, we can't fix 
Sometimes they destroy their bladder, but also they destroy the urethra. So uh, even if you try to repair, they stay in the uh, incontinent. They are incontinent. And this really is a big problem. When they have AIDS, it's the same. AIDS is not only, they can transmit this AIDS to the next generation, next generation, but also they can contaminate people around them. We have the psychosocial consequences, and this is uh, maybe even the very hard question to deal with because you can treat the disease and succeed, you can make operation and succeed, but for the psychologi uh, psychological consequences, sometimes it can take very long time because before to get the result. And if it happens that the women have a child born after rape, this is even more complicated because always when the child don't succeed or when he, he can do a bad things, uh, as all the child, uh, children are doing, mothers are coming just to say, okay, you advise me to keep this pregnant, or uh, I, I would like not to get this child with me, but uh, now I want you to take him, and sometimes they're calling these this, this children, your Mukwege children or snake children, and there is really, it's a big problem for mothers when they have there's children born after rape to treat them psychologically, even socially, because they are not accepted in the family, but also sometimes in the community. We have also socioeconomic consequence because um, most of the time women are working very hard in our community. And uh, when you destroy them, when they become sick, of course, there is consequences on socioeconomic level. We have a legal, we have legal problems because we have a good law, but uh, this law is not implemented. And uh, the children without birth certification, I'm wondering what will happen in Congo in, in maybe now five years because we have now children who are 15, uh, 16 at Panzi, and they start really to ask this question, who I am? I have a name, but I, I want to know who is my father, who is my mother? And uh, I can say that we don't really equip to deal with this kind of question. And I'm, I'm worried that it can be a big problem in the future for all the community and all the country. So, how this consequence is happening? When you did the, uh, when this army group uh, did the collective rape and rape in public, we can ask ourselves why to do this in public? Why to rape a woman in front of the husband, the children? It's just really to create humiliation, shame and lack of confidence in all the community. The husband, before I was really very tough with husband to see that they, they could not, not only they could not protect their wife, but also just to let them and reject them. But when I start to talk with men, they really un understood that women was harm and hurt physically and mentally, but men, their mind was completely destroyed. And uh, when men in the village told you, you are at all men again, you have the feeling that you are not men. This mean a lot. To lose confidence, will bring the community to lose also the cohesion. Because if you say that you are not men in your family, so when I, I use this example, in a church they rape a wife of the pastor in front of all the 
member of the church. So after no one accept to go in this church because they said, where will your God if your wife could be raped in, in public? You know, all this kind of things is done exactly to destroy this self-confidence and destroy the fabric of the society, the link between people. A, a, a wife don't believe in her the husband because the husband didn't protect her. The child have impression that our parents didn't anything for us when the army group came, they didn't protect us. So when you just destroy this link between community, you lose the social cohesion and the identity of the community. And this will really bring that the population have just to live, to look for anonymity, become just to talk about it. The consequence for the society, as I said, we have seen in many conflicts where the goal is just to try to get the demography to go down because they have impression that we are fighting against this group and the only one way for them to go on with a strong demography is if we destroy them and destroy women by sterilization, by spreading AIDS and other diseases, so you, we, we can win on the population. What are the solution? And here, I want to talk more by what you are doing at Pansy Hospital. Now, Congo is going in a conflict for two decades, and rape was used massively by the army group, but unfortunately with also the government forces. I don't want to go back about uh, Panzi. I think that Eleanor, she knows my everything even more than myself <laughs> about the relation between Sweden and, uh, and Congo. But uh, we treat more than 50,000 victims of sexual violence at Panzi Hospital. And I can say that this number is only a number, and I don't really some time want to talk about number, because I think that we should think about what is behind. Always there is a woman who are suffering, and we need really to think more about, about this suffering. And the women who are coming to the hospital are only the one who can reach the hospital. So it's the top of the iceberg, the number that we have at the hospital. We have this uh, care for survivors, and uh, we are doing it a one-stop center. It means just that we are trying to treat patients at one place and get everything done only at one place. And this is giving really an advantage because when we start, we used to send victims to go to look for a specialist of AIDS in one place, maybe to look for a um, lawyer at another place, to restart even in the hospital, to talk again and again about what happened. And our experience was that women were just refusing. When they told us our, their story one time, most of the time, even one time is enough. So if you ask them to repeat again for each service to repeat what happened, most of the time it was just to say, okay, they just left the place without getting our service. So we create this model where they can get everything, they can give their story one time, and they have one mama sherry, it's a social assistant, to support them and just 
bring them everywhere where they want to get a service that can be supported by the Mama Sherry. Most of, of them are the social assistant. In this model, we are trying really to work on base evidence because for many things, when it comes, for example, for the medical treatment, for many kind of surgeon, we need really to get base evidence by, uh, for what we are doing because we don't have many publication about, for example, I can say, how to take care of children where their, um, where, when they are raped very young. And uh, really, we found children under five years. It was very important to make a kind of protocol, how we can do it, so share this protocol with others in other places. And our treatment in this model is uh, a centered treatment on human. So everything that we are doing, we are trying to do it centered on the victims. And uh, we saw that it was not enough just to treat patient and be in the hospital. I used to say swing, swing patient, but we need, we need also to make advocacy that this can stop For the medical treatment, there you can see a child of, uh, I think she was 20, 24 years, raped by adult. So you have the bladder, the vagina and the rectum completely destroyed. And uh, we have some protocols when it comes to children after uh, under five years. We have also protocols for to treat the HIV and other sexual transmitted disease. And all this protocol, we are trying to share it with other medical structure in the country. And even now, we start even to support other countries who really need also to go through, who are, have the same problem as us, as, for example, in Republic of Central Africa. We are trying also to establish this kind of clinic in, in Iraq and so on. We have the medical support mobile clinics because all women can't reach the hospital because they are so weak, sometimes because only they are so poor or it's far off our place. So we have the mobile clinic who is going in the rural area to campaign and raise awareness against rape and its consequence. But also we are training. We have a training of the health workers in other centers so we can get all the patients coming to our hospital. This, when we are treating medically, I think that now we are in really a, a discussion because we need to get the evidence. Without evidence, you can't go to the justice. And uh, it's really very difficult to make, to get this evidence, especially when people are fighting and maybe we are going to talk about reparation, when I'm asking that we should get a reparation for women in a conflict area because it's so difficult. But what we are trying to do with our training is to get that each person who are taking care of victim of sexual violence must be able to collect proof because without this, this evidence, we are not able to go on in our treatment who need also justice. And there I'm, I'm showing you just how we are training 
uh, we are doing a training for different people, and we find that even the police and the justice actors, most of the time, they don't have enough information about rape. And it's uh, when you come, a, a woman come to them to ask justice, for example, the police and justice actors, when they don't know how to do, is to start to ask questions. How it happened? This is it true? Why you were at this place and so on? But we just realize that it is also ignorance for many people to don't know how to deal with uh, victim of sexual violence. We have this kind of uh, certificate to document everything. And in our model, we are documenting things even if the police and the justice don't ask us to do it. Because we know that women, when they came, they are traumatized. The first thing they are asking is not to go to justice. What they are asking is to get treatment. But in this model, when they are strong enough physically, they are strong enough mentally and autonomous, the last thing they are asking is justice. And it can happen maybe six months, one year, many years after. So in this model, you need to be ready with all the documentation and just keep it. If she don't ask it, you keep it somewhere. Because if she came after many years, you still have the capacity to document and, uh, and give her the documentation. Yeah, I want uh, maybe to go fast, but I would like to say about the documentation. We are using now the new technology of information and communication, and this is really a way that everywhere a nurse or a medical doctor can take information where you are in the conflict area. Sometimes these armed groups or the forces can come to try to get the documentation and the evidence that you have. So with this system, it's possible to get all the information and send all this information in the cloud, and there you are quiet. Even if they come and they take all your equipment, you can be sure that your information are already stored somewhere where they can't touch it. And it happened many times that our staff was under threat because they want just to get all evidence. So, um, for the psychological support, we have many activities who can be, who can target individuals, and there we have social assistants, psychologists, and psychiatrists who are working with victims. But well, we have also some activities in groups, and uh, today we are doing artistic and uh, body focused therapy, including music, karate, and ergotherapy. And I think that for, for example, for the, the music, we are doing really a research to know, to see how music can be um, a therapy for the group. Because in Africa, when there is a problem, where there is a catastrophe, most of the time, they are using music. But it's not, we, we, we want to document our music and see how this music can impact uh, the mental of, uh, of our patient. And uh, we are really doing a good study on this, and I think that it will be published soon. We have also Maison d'Orcas and Cité de la Joie. It's a place where sometimes where women are rejected and the community don't want them to come back or they are not ready to go back in the community. We are taking care of them at these two places where they can benefit with different kind of therapy until they can feel that they, are, they can feel that they are enough strong to go back in their community. 
For to support legally, we have a training of paralegals, and this may be, it's difficult here to understand it, but in many villages, you don't have lawyers, you don't have police, you don't have someone who really uh, know how to deal with justice. But in villages now we are training, we can train priests, priest, pastors, teachers, medical doctor to be as a paralegal. So when this happens, they can know exactly how to deal with the question. And after we are giving legal assistance to all women, and uh, it's sorry, but uh, this way to do to organize mobile cut hearings is a very effective way to conduct this mobile cut where the rape happened. So the perpetrator can be we in the village and be done in front of all the community. It's very effective but because it's a way also for women to show that it was not my fault. And it's a kind not only of justice, but it's a kind also of reparation. Because sometimes reparation can be only to apologize. And I've seen women who were very, very happy and they re restart a new life just because the perpetrator was, com was convicted in public. So they feel that, okay, this was, was not my fault. So we are doing, a, we are in our organization, Panzi Foundation, we are supporting a lot of this kind of activities. For the socioeconomic reintegration, we have many uh, kind of activities, education, We are supporting women with literacy. Uh, we have to, uh, san the sensitization of uh, children born after uh, sexual violence. We are doing many family mediation because at the beginning, women were rejected by the community. But I can see that now things start to change and this we, we are targeting to change also the behavior so people can understand that women don't, the body of women don't belong to the community or don't belong to the husband or the family, but it belongs to women. So the, most of the problem in some community is that when it happened to women, the community have feel ashamed uh, about what's happened. And for to feel better is just to reject a woman. So it's the second, I can say, traumatization for, for women. And we are working a lot to support the social so we can make this change of behavior. We need also to bring people to be accountable for what it happened. You know that today, rape can be used as a tool for genocide, but it can be also a crime against humanity, but also a war crime. What, when it happened, we need really to focus on the accountability. No one should, no rape should be unpunished. But today we can see in many countries, we have many problems to bring perpetrators to the court. And it's our responsibility all to know that we can't accept this kind of way to treat women in our society. And we have to join our forces to bring our perpetrators to, res to be res accountable for rape when this happened. We need also to fight for protection. And uh, for this, we are working more with men and women. And I used to say that it's very important that men can engage in this question. I know that we are many, many men, maybe 19, 99% of men who are not raping. But the big problem is that men are just keeping silence. And when you keep silence, 
You can't say, I'm not rapist, so I have nothing to do with this. Because it's destroying our common humanity. So we need men to engage in this question and to fight for the rights of women. Because when we are fighting for the rights of women, we are fighting for our own rights. And then we are engaging uh, religion leaders, health personnel, local, local authorities, and to fight against gender norms. In doing so, we are doing a lot of seminars, campaign on the national and international level. We are doing advocacy to fight impunity. And if you follow me in Oslo, really, I focus on fight against impunity. Because if there are things who are pushing rape to be spread, is most of is silence and impunity. And if you don't fight against silence and impunity, we can be sure that rape will just increasing in the conflict area. Little by little, victims are healing. Survivors of sexual violence treat their wounds, restore their dignity, and become agents of change in the, their community with this model of one-stop center who are just taking the medical support, social, economic reintegration, legal assistance, and psychological support to transform a victim in survivors. And there, you are transforming their pain, their suffering, to strength. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very moving lecture, and I think you sense from the reception that you um, gave us a lot to think about. And I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the audience, and I will open up for that in, in just a second. Uh, I just wanted to start with asking you in, uh, and go back to this, what we can do here to, to help this situation. And in almost all of your speeches, you point out that one of the driving forces behind the wars that lead to this horrible violence is the uh, struggle for control over resources and land, and, and, and in particular the minerals and the co uh, conflict minerals that we are using for mobile phones and, and laptops and, and batteries and so on. Um, are you getting the sense that the world is starting to listen? Are the world leaders doing enough? Are we as consumers, for example in Sweden, doing enough with our power as consumers when we go to the store and buy this, mm -hmm. these electoral devices? Uh, is the message getting through? Yeah. Uh, I want to just to say that uh, all of us, uh, myself, I uh, have my smartphone somewhere there, and I need it. Today, we can't work without our electronic equipment. This is sure. But the big question is, why you can go on dealing with the m uh, conflict minerals in place to say, this place we have conflict and there is minerals, as I show on, on one map. Why we can't work to get peace in this place? And I think that today we have many rules, Frank Dodd, OCD, European rules for to get uh, a due diligence of uh, the chain of supply. These all things are good, and I think that companies have to follow it because the question today is that on this place we have war. But the big question for me is why we, can, we can't impose peace in these places. 
I know that in the, the Second World War, we, the, the, the world decided that this war had to stop, and they did. Today, it's really a big question about Congo. You know that I was in Japan, and they told me, today we can't work in our companies without the Chantal coming from Congo, because you have maybe 70, 80% of the Chantal uh, on the planet. This is a lot. And the Chantal is used in all the electronic devices. And we know where this Chantal is coming from. And we know that children and women are suffering a lot. They are losing their life. They are raped and destroyed, as I come just to show you in this place. Tomorrow, it will be a problem with cobalt. I know that we need the electric cars. We need, really, to protect our environment. And you know that more than 60% of the global cobalt is in Congo. So this will be also a new problem. And the last, we have the second rainforest of the world. And this forest, without rule of law, in war, everyone is doing what he wants. He can cut, he can burn. Mm. And my question is, why the world is indifferent? is only be maybe to get more benefits. But we need to think about our next generations. All these things don't belong on only to Congo. The problem of Congo become more global. And my question is how we can say in the 21st century that we are not able to stop people who are fighting with machete. <laughs> they don't have nuclear weapons. The last, the last is, I think that we as consumers we have a power. Our power is not to say we don't want to buy cell phone, we don't want to buy electric cars. This is not a question. It's not the question to say all the companies have to pull out from Congo. The question is to say in our century we can say this war can stop and we have capacity to do it. In Congo, we are not even, we don't have any, any company who is uh, making guns. So it's possible. They're, they're just using machete and, and, and small things. So I think that you consumer, you can create a movement to say this war can stop. Is what I really we ask and what we, we can get also if the consumer can decide to do it. Mm -hmm. A message for all of us, I think. We open up for questions from the audience. We have two microphones, one on that side and one on that side. And uh, please keep your questions short, then we have time for a couple more, and uh, raise your hands. So we start on this side. Please. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mokwege, for the work that you do. And my question is, do you see in a nearby future or a longer future, if you wish, that this kind of sexual violence against women could come to an end? Yeah. I believe that if all the states around the world can just take a decision to say, if someone uses rape as a weapon of war to get a position, or to win a war, will never accept him, and we have a regime of sanctions. We can use sanctions, and this sanction can be, for example, to refuse a visa, to refuse their money to come in your country, to refuse to just to get a meeting with them. It will be a kind of putting these people who are using women in a very bad way just for to get a position, to put them out of action internationally. And this, I hope that it can work, because if we make a lobby about this question, so everyone can understand, I want to get 
power in my country, but if I use the body of women as a battlefield, maybe I will more be in prison, inspired to be a president or a commander. And this is what I'm calling to draw the red line. If we draw this red line, we did it with chemical weapon, with biological weapon, and I think that we can do it with sexual violence. We can start somewhere. Okay, then we take a question on this side. Yeah, um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much for the seminar. Um, and my question is regarding like actually um, putting like rapists in jail for what, what they have done, because it seems like even in Sweden, we're like, it's a really rich country, uh, we don't have war, but still like 99% of all the rapists are free uh, and not in jail. So my question is like, how, how can we ever find a world where, where, where the number of rapists actually are prosecuted and end up in jail? Because it seems like we have so many odds against us because they're so hard to find evidence and everything. So um, yeah. Mm, <laughs> what thank you. Think? Yeah. <coughs> I think that this really is a question of political will. And uh, to prosecute uh, the perpetrators, if there is no will, they can prosecute just the small fish. But we know that there is also a resolution who is clear that if rape ma mass rape happen, it must be a responsible. Uh, and what I said, to be accountable. You can be a commander, you can be a president of a country, and let your citizen to be raped and say, it was not me. You have a responsibility when you are a commander, you have to educate, to protect, to give information, and if you don't do this, you have to respond for what your troop can do on the ground. And I think that in many places, this is not really done. And we should work on it, that uh, to use the resolution 1820, we should use it. And I have impression that this is not really used enough in many conflicts, where you can see that, yeah, it's uh, more discussion about how to do it. But if all the commander and responsible, they know that if they don't, prevent, they will be accountable. This can make a change. It's not only to, to prosecute the, uh, the soldiers, on the, but they should be accountable for all the rape or violence who can occur by their troop on the, on the ground. And to do so, we need a political will. Mm -hmm. Next question. Please. Thank you so much for, for your lecture. Uh, I remember being down in Congo and visiting the Pansi Hospital in 2006 with my family and, and you giving us a fantastic tour of, of your work and your facility. Uh, and I'm glad that the Nobel Committee has honored your work. Uh, looking for the future, uh, and opportunities. I mean, obviously there are many different things that can be done. I mean, you've mentioned a few of them yourself. Which one would you say is the, the first next step to take? I mean, there's a process that you have put in place, and how can we carry on the work to, to get further down the, the fantastic work that you've done? Hmm? Okay. I don't really understand the question. What are the most important tasks ahead in this, in this area, do you think, mm -hmm. for the future? Of uh, in this work, what, what's that your question? Yeah. yeah, what's what's the most important thing if you look ahead? Yeah, uh, I think that what uh, really we we are asking for this question. First, I think I said about the international community, if they can come and draw this red line and say just this can't be accepted at all, and it. If each person do it, he must face consequences of what, what he did. This is the first thing. The second thing, we are uh, thinking that 
internationally, we should really think about the right of women to access to treatment, the holistic care. And the holistic care for us is a way also to rebuild the community, but also to give strength to women, because I can see the experience when women are they are going through this model that I come just to, uh, to present here, most of the time they become really strong in their community and strong enough to be agent of changes. And I think that working on doing that, this should be a human right, not uh, just a treatment because they, they seek it, but it should be as a human right. When it happens, it means that women will not protected, and we as human, we have responsibility to protect, and it happens, we have this responsibility at least to treat consequences. And uh, within the model, we have the legal aspect. And for us today, everywhere, we have few countries where there is reparation. And reparation is all the actions that we can do to just give satisfaction and compensation to victims of sexual violence. And this can be to build, for example, memorials. It can be also just to apologize. And I think that if this start to come in our global culture, that when it happens, we have to do reparation. Reparation means that we accept that this must not be, should not be done, and we have responsibility not only to do the compensation, but also reparation. And when we talk about reparation, people have impression that is to distribute money. No. I think that many women I met, it was things that we can do. But today, no one wants to deal with this question of reparation. So I think that uh, in the near future, I want you to be with us, to fight to draw this red line, to fight to get reparation for women all over the world. They need it. They need it just because they want us to accept them as human, as ourselves. Mm -hmm. Then then we have time for two, two, the two last questions, one there and then there, and start with you, please. Thank you for your uh, seminar and your very encouraging uh, words. Uh, I'm thinking about the children that you mentioned who are not uh, possible to register as of uh, uh, those uh, uh, victims uh, who are especially children who will tomorrow need to see hope for the future. Uh, your connections with Sweden and Umeå University and students who are very eager to help out in volunteering uh, in, in any way possible. Do you have any kind of uh, suggestions how one could, sitting here, be able to uh, contribute today as the situation is in helping those children to see that there is hope in, in their life? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, for these children who have some ideas. And, uh, you know, when they don't have affiliation in the community, is really very dangerous because there, when they grow, they grow up, people are just telling them, you are a snake child, you are uh, genocidal, you are, and so on. And all these terrible things is just to prepare violence in, in the future. And it's a kind of transmission of violence to the next generation. And for us, we are thinking that to get identity is a first thing, because when you, you don't have identity, is a terrible thing. So you, you don't have reference for your life. To help is really to support that, this kind of children, if the family, the community, don't want them, they should be adopted by others who will love them and give them identity. But today it's very hard in my country 
to get this kind of adoption. So at the end, we have all these children in the streets, and this is not a solution. So if we can join our forces to try to get for all these children, not only registration, but identity, and the identity is to get a name, to get family, and, and, and feel that you, uh, the child belongs to a system. And this really is a challenge. But uh, I'm sure that with uh, your, your will, our will, we can make a difference. Thank you. OK, the last audience question. Dr. Mukwege. Shikamu na hungera sana. Marahaba. Asante. Asante. Napenda kusema hivyo tu. Mungu akubarike na ukul, akulinde kila siku katika kazi yako muhimu sana. Asante. Asante. <laughs> it is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to end uh, by asking you, the last time you were here, you got the question, what your most beautiful memory from Congo is? Uh, and you gave a very strong uh, answer. You can look it up on the internet. Uh, and you said that particularly the women in Congo, their determination and their courage gives you hope for the future in your work. Could you tell the, this audience uh, as well a couple of words of what it is in Congo, despite all this, this situation, all this violence, what is it there that gives you hope for the future and strength to carry on? Yeah, uh, definitely I think that uh, for me, if I can go on, it's only because women everywhere, but women of Congo, especially women I'm treating, I'm so impressed by what they are. Their strength, their capacity of love, their capacity to fight for the right of their children, the right of others, even to fight for my own right, is something I'm finding that it's um, fantastic. I, I, I don't know how to, how to express it. And uh, I think the last time I said, I was at the point that I said I can't go on. After the attack in my house, I just feel that this was enough try to kill me, but uh, they kill one of my friends, and it was in front of my children. Uh, it was so hard for me. And really, I could not stay there. I, I just feel that, yes, I was doing things with treating patients, but what happened to me is enough. And I leave the country. And last time I said, I was in Boston. When women start to write to all the authorities, the President Kabila, they wrote to the Secretary General. They didn't get answer. And there, they found really a very strategic way. They come to the hospital and they said, no one wants to listen to, to us, but we need our doctor back. And everyone said, ha. Ah, you have to forget uh, he already left and he will never come back. But then they said, we took a decision. We're going each Friday to sell fruit and vegetables and bring the money here at the hospital until we get the total amount to, to buy the ticket for him to come back. <laughs> this, this <laughs> the second thing that they said, we want, if no one wants to give him security, we, ha we are thousands of women. Oh. And we'll each night, 24 hours, we'll get 25 women around the house and we'll be around him. So if someone wants really to kill him, have to kill 25 women before to kill him. I just feel, <laughs> I was so tired. And this was very strong because I, I was, when I was treating them, I could say that they were very weak. But there, I was weak, 
and women were strong. And they bring me back in Congo. Oh. Thank you. On behalf uh, of all of us, I just want to say it's been an honor to listen to your memorable words today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank you.